precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired. I, I am weak. I. Was fabulous. I told Steve I've never really liked the harmonica. <laughs> Makes me think kind of like backwater somewhere. But the way that you played and the way that you all did that arrangement was fabulous. So let's give them another. Thank you. I assure you, you're not the first to tell I'm me. I'm not the first to say that. Yeah, it kind of scares me a little bit. And so one of the reasons we gave the, the choir a break for these few weeks was for us to get an opportunity to get to know Steve and see 
some of what he can do. I hear tell he plays about five instruments. But for us to get a feel for him as we're looking at where is God leading us musically. And so I've had a, a taste and I, and I thank you. And so I ask you to hold on that we may be doing some things differently, but it's a different time. And let us just be excited about what God is going to do and lead us. And yes, our choir and folks will be back. Oh, yeah. um, but right now we're doing a transitional thing and allowing everyone to kind of get a feel. And next week we're gonna do a meet and greet with Steve after worship. So if you have any questions or things you wanna ask him um, or things that he may wanna share, we're gonna do that in coffee hour next week. All right. So God, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you've already done. I feel like just saying breathe. Breathe on me, oh God. In this moment to share a few words, oh God, it's one of those days and so we, we ask for your presence. I ask for your glory. I ask for the preaching anointing. I ask for open ears to hear that in messages there's always a lot of different things but help us to to hone in on that which you want us to hear or that which you want us to hold on to for the days and weeks to come and help us to just chew on it chewing on the word is another word for meditate that we don't just come on Sunday to hear a word and someone is preaching at us, that there is a message for us in the midst of it. And you desire for us to take the week or days or however long and chew on that message, to chew on it so that we can digest it, so that what you have for us becomes part of us. And because that, it becomes that thing that propels us forward and allows us to stiffen our back and allows us to see what we couldn't see before with our natural eyes. So have your way today, oh God, in the powerful name of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. So as I said earlier, this is the sixth Sunday after Easter. And church, we are moving through the lectionary, you may have heard that term, the lectionary is the church calendar. We tend to flow through a church calendar. Not all churches do that, but most mainline churches will follow a theme throughout the year. Um, that doesn't mean if the Holy Spirit doesn't move us in another direction or if there's a situation we need to attend to, we shift. But it is a discipline to go through the church calendar. And so we've been going through this calendar, and as we go through, you, you tend to see the cycles, right? And so we're moving into Pentecost. We have gone through, we started back in Advent with the birth of Christ, and we moved through to Lent, right, to Good Friday, to Easter. And now in this sixth Sunday of Easter, we're a couple weeks away from Pentecost. Pentecost in the Christian church is the day when the church was really born, right? When the Holy Spirit descended from above onto those that were gathered. And so Pentecost is May 19th, and that will be the Sunday that Gigi Van Dyke and Serendipity will be with us. But on that day in Pentecost, the disciples were all together in a room again. And you've heard me preaching about how all of these times, periodically, they're in a room. They're in a room locked up together, usually fear or they're waiting. Christ had sent them ahead to go and wait for the gift, he said, that I'm going to send. And so they were in that room. And I shared with you that I liken those rooms as the church. Because where two or three are gathered together, Christ says, there I am in the midst. So they were in that room waiting for the promised gift, which was the Holy Spirit. And so the, the, the book of Acts really walks through that from that time when they were gathered to all of the Acts of the Apostles, which is the actual name of that book, uh, all of the things that the Apostles did after receiving that power from on high. 
And so with that, as we are walking through, I want to just put a pause in here today about centered living, right? Centered living. Sometimes in preaching, you make up these titles and you're trying to connect. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But I'm talking about being centered, right? When, I don't know if it's happened to you, but when I've gone to workshops and gone to training, sometimes in a meeting, sometimes even in church, when we're getting started, we will say, let's take a moment and breathe. Let's take a moment and get centered. Because we come in even into church. We come from different places, thinking about different things, stressed out, not really focused on what's at hand. And so it's helpful to have centering moments. Some people pray during those moments. Some people breathe in and breathe out. Some people stretch. Some people come in and listen to music. There's no accident that we've shifted our worship to have some moments before we start to just hear the piano or the organ for us to be centered, to prepare ourselves to receive. And so centered living is really what uh, I was able to get out of this text. If we have a strong center, and those of you who work out, we're getting there. Those of you that work out know that the core is the center. And if you have a strong core, you can do just about anything, just about any kind of exercise. So I'm, I'm just using examples for you to think about that centeredness and why it's so important to be centered. Being centered allows us to, again, breathe and stretch and focus to make the central point central. It allows us to move out from the center, to go where we need to go and do what we need to do. It allows us to have an existence in a primary place, but as we move out, we take what we need from the center to go to those other places. Jesus always focused on what was central. Christ is our example, folks. Christ always focused on the main thing. Christ always focused from when he entered into the scene until the end. Focused on God, focused on his mission, and focused on God's people. Christ always focused on God, he said, he and the Father, we are one, I and the Father. He focused on his mission. Nothing deterred him from his mission, but he never forgot about us. We are in there. We are the disciples that followed him. We are the disciples that he met on the side of the road and, and healed. We are the disciples who served him and tended to him. We are the disciples who ran to him and said, heal me. We are the woman with the issue of blood who followed him in a crowd, who was bent over with an issue of blood for many, many years, who thought to herself, she didn't even say it, she thought to herself, if I just touch the hem of his garment, not the whole garment, but the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Those are the people and though we did not live in that time, those people represent us today. Christ is still healing people. Christ is still meeting people where they are. Christ is still saving people. Christ is still calling people and loving people along the way. So a few words of things that jumped out in that text and one is abide and we talked about abiding last week when i brought that beautiful plant that was dying on my deck and i talked about pruning and how in order for that plant to produce more fruit at some point that it had to be pruned and that god does that to us right if some of you remember that that god will will cut us back so to speak because God loves us like a plant that when it is trimmed, it is healthier 
It can resist disease and it can blossom. And I also mentioned the hard part about that is that even those of us who are already blooming and doing well sometimes think it's strange when we go through situations that prune us. Because who would think that a beautiful flower would need to be pruned? But even the flowers that are blooming, God will prune. We prune as gardeners so that there can be more. Because everywhere you cut, if there was one flower, when you cut, oftentimes two shoots come. And if you cut the others, you have two more shoots. It is like that within our lives. And so the first word that jumped out was that abide, because this follows that text from last week. Right, that we are called to abide in the vine. We are, we are called to abide in Christ. The other word that jumped out was love. And sometimes I think we throw that word around. And we talk about, and, and, our, and these preachers are often guilty of it, right? Just love God. You know, sometimes people look at us like, really? What, what, what do you mean? How do, I, how do I do that? What are you talking about? And we know there's all different kinds of love. I don't remember all of the names of them, but there's like filio, and then there's, there's romantic love, there's friendship love. But the command that Christ gave in this section was to love one another. Love one another because God is love. Love one another because Christ loved us so that Christ laid down his life for us. Many of us know that scripture that most of us use in Christendom that says, for God so loved the world that God gave God's one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's love, love that came from God. But in our humanity, sometimes it's not that easy. And so we say love, but not everybody has grown up in a loving home. Not everybody has had healthy love. Not everybody has an understanding of what it is. So what is this love? What does it look like? And the best example I can give is to go to 1 Corinthians 13. And it sounds passe, and people use it on their wedding programs because it's so cute but it is really reflective of what love is, of who God is and who God calls us to be. And so in this letter to the church at Corinth, Paul told them that love is, it's patient. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but the key things is that love is patient. When we lose our patience with someone, are we really loving? It doesn't mean that we need to sit there, but sometimes we have to just walk away. There are many people that I have to love from a distance. <laughs> love, it's patient. Paul said love is kind. This one got me. Love doesn't hold a record of wrongs. How many of us have a laundry list, even if we haven't written it, of all the things that someone has done? You guys are more holy than I because they come back to mind when someone has hurt us, when someone has taken advantage of us, when we've told someone how to treat us and they continue to do the opposite. It is easy for us to have a laundry list or a mental list, but true love doesn't hold a record. True, true love casts it away. True love requires us maybe to change ourselves because we've allowed someone else to have more power over us than they should. He said that love, it upholds all. It undergirds us. True love undergirds us. True love allows us to be frail at times. No one can be superwoman all the time. It, it allows us to be frail at times. It endures all that we don't just walk out on friends and relationships easily because true love allows us to endure all, but it doesn't mean we have to be taken advantage of. True love, it never fails. It may look like failure, 
but it never fails. So that's the love that he's talking about in this text, and that's an example of the love that God is calling us to exhibit. We don't say that we love someone and then we hit them. Most of the time it is women who are on the other end of domestic violence as an example, and we do a lot of work with the domestic violence center. You, you can't say that you love me and you punch me. You may love me, but your love has been warped, right? What true love looks like. Another word that came up in that text was giving. Again, with love, we give. Love doesn't hold things. Love, love doesn't hoard. What he's talking about in this, in this text is that the greatest gift God gave us was Jesus. And the greatest gift that Jesus gave us was his life. True love gives. True love is the gift that keeps on giving. And so what he calls us to do in this text is to be like God and to be like Christ. Remember the old commercials, well, don't want to be like Mike. To be like Christ. And to give our love away. And in doing so, he says, I will no longer call you servants, <clears throat> but I call you friends. And I struggled with that one. I don't like that word servant. It may be because I am authentically an African-American woman. I, I, I don't like that word servant, but I understand in this context what he's talking about. He's saying you're not just a servant. You're called to be a servant leader. You're called to serve. We're called to serve the church and God. But when he shifts and calls us friends, Centered living brings us to friendship with God. It is not cheap friendship. It is friendship, he says, because you know who I am. You know where I'm going. You know the secret things that I've taught you, what my father has taught me. He says, I too have taught you. So you are not just in my house doing things. You are in my house, part of my family is what he's talking about, about being a friend. And I'm gonna end it here because I heard the bell, but think about the cross and what that symbolizes. I think we often become very common with the things of God. And that doesn't mean that we're not a friend with God. It doesn't mean that God has not called us, but the things that God has shared with us to call us friend is for the ministry. It's for us to give. It's, it's okay that we are praying and we can sit and we can talk to God and we can pray to God. But ultimately, what we had is bigger than our emotions and bigger than our personal relationship. It is for the world. And many of our churches, you will hear them say, oh, it's only about a personal relationship with God. Has anyone ever heard that? It's all about a personal relationship. That's just the beginning. Many people end there. Is it just about you and God? The relationship is with you and God. That's the upward part. I guess that's vertical, right? That's the vertical relationship with us and God. But if you look at that cross, there's wings on that cross. That that's for us to the world. It is a head situation as well as a heart situation. And, it, and we're called and equipped to share with the world, to make disciples in the world, to be examples, right? To be examples of those who have walked with God and are walking with God and seeking God. But church, it all comes from a centered place, a grounded place. Because if we are not grounded, we can be tossed to and fro with the winds of change, with the winds of the political climate, with the winds of people who change their mind, it is so easy for us to be tossed to and fro. But my God, when we are centered in Christ, 
We are centered and we're unstoppable, unshakable, and unmovable, which is the place that God desires us to be. And when we get to that place, there is joy. He talked about that at the end, and I'm ready, Erica. He talked about joy. are not going well, when we feel good, when we don't feel good, we don't always feel like coming to church, we don't always feel like going to work, but when we do it out of that centered place, there is joy, not an emotional exercise, we're not just feeling happy, scripture says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. I don't know about you, but there are days when there is not enough strength to go around. There's not enough focus, not enough energy, not enough anything. But that joy that is deep down becomes our strength. May you receive that today in a place of centered living and have your center and your core tight. I think that's what the trainers always say. Tighten your core. Tighten your core this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.